My name is Josh Chin. I'm a reporter with the Wall Street Journal based in China, I report on tech and politics. And I'm here with, who are you again? Um, I think I'm just a data I create. The question is, am I the data that I create knowingly and willingly, voluntarily that I share, or am I the data that I don't want to share? Right. So I think my question for you is, Aren't the fears we have about data more important than anything else? They're more important than anything else. Um, I think that they, the fears that people have about data are more important than people who create the technologies we use realize they are, right? Um, I think that, and then, and then those fears are also growing. So I think the fears are real. And let me just enumerate a few of them. Sure. So one fear is that if there is wrong data about you. So for example, some passports I have say Andreas Weigand, others say Sebastian. And I have fears that someday when I, at the border, that, that will cause trouble. Because every time I leave the US, I leave as Sebastian. Every time I come in, I come in as Andreas, so they are net probably 200 extra Andreas's here and 200 Sebastian's missing. It's a frightening thought. Yeah, so the key fear I have is the fear that governments will do something against me based potentially based on wrong data. Right, right. And this happens, right? We're, we're happened seeing... to my dad yeah. who was in prison in right. East Germany based on, you know, some would argue, wrong data that right. he was an American spy. Right. So I think that is somewhat close to home. Right. Very different for me is the fear of having to let go of the illusion that we think we are pretty good. That the data actually prove that we are not. We had this experience today with your, uh, with your otter transcript. Right? We had, uh, so today we, well, we, gave presentations and Andreas's was transcribed in real time uh, on a gigantic screen by, by Otter AI and, uh, and, and, and Andreas uncharacteristically seemed a little like flustered at one point by, uh, by, by seeing his words transcribed because on the screen. Because there were mistakes and rather than simply ignoring them and saying that is just technology, I felt observed and I felt that I need to enunciate better to get the transcript correct behind me. Right. And is that, I mean, some people might argue that that's a good thing, right? That this is, the being observed is making you a better speaker and therefore a better person. I hear that the Chinese government argues that society will be better, more harmonious, which was the term a few years ago, um, by observing people. What do you think about that? I think, that, I think that that's correct. I think that's, what, that's exactly what the, the party believes. They, the, what the party, I think, is doing is that they want people to believe that they're being observed, whether they're actually being observed or not. And they, and they think that that, um, that will serve as a stand-in for morality, for public morality that has sort of seeped out of the country as the country has embraced capitalism. That is very interesting. That what matters, and that goes back to Foucault, and back uh, to Bentham with the Panopticon. Sure, yeah. That it does matter that you observe people. What matters is that they think they could be observed. Right, right, right. And it's an interesting, uh, I mean, in the US, I wonder how, to what extent that's going to become the dynamic. I think we need to go one step further. I think we need to assume that everything is being recorded. My book starts with right. that assumption. Sure. The question which I believe here in a democratic society we should negotiate is what actually can be done with the data? First, with data that is actually correct and then now with deep fakes. Right. That I think really hits us. Your question, who are you? 
when you look at something and you don't know anymore whether that really happened or whether it's just a deep fake. That right. Is, that is knocking on our beliefs about identity. Right. And what can, what can be done about that? Should I, anything be done about that? I think I first love that some of the things which we really grew up with get shaken up. Hmm. In 89, the night before my birthday, my parents called me on the landline because there were no mobiles. And I was a PhD student at Stanford. And they said, my dad said, Andreas, the wall has come down. And I said, thank you for calling me for my birthday. <laughs> and I thought, you know, the idea of being funny or something. No, that, no, really. And then came a sense I'll never forget. We saw it with our own eyes on television. <laughs> right, right. And the next day, New York Times reported it. Then I actually believed it. Right. <laughs> Right, right. Well, it's a great advertisement for the New York Times. Um, <laughs> uh, no, no, that, that, you know, let's talk about you, Trevor. I was in <laughs> Chiang Mai uh, about a month ago, and I spoke at a TEDx because I was in Thailand, and I was with a friend of mine who I've known since around that time, who is uh, the chair of a computer science department in Hong Kong. And at dinner, after we gave our speeches, he works in AI as well. I sat down and said, so, how is Hong Kong? And I got that speech, pro-mainland government. Mm -hmm. I said, but you got your PhD at Berkeley. I mean, we've known it for 30-something years. And then he asked me, so, what do you read? And I said, I read the Wall Street Journal. Mm. And he said, oh, those Western liberal media? I mean, what do you expect? And I thought that was interesting because that's right. what I subscribe to. And happily so, by the way. <laughs> you should subscribe too. Um, uh, that is interesting. Um, but that's when I realized that we don't really know what reality is. And then I made a video in Singapore right. with my friend, Josh, he is now like 12, my godchild. Right. And his dad. And we said, look, somewhere in the world, they say that those evil protesters are attacking the police. Or people who are even dressing like them. And other people say, look at that evil police. They are attacking the protesters. What do we know where the reality is? What do we know where the right. truth is? Is there truth in data, or is it all interpretation? Right. Well, if the, if it'll, it sounds like you're suggesting it is interpretation. It is very difficult. And if it's a world, that, if the world is all interpretation, what does that, what does that mean for, for meaning? So, yeah, I'm very Wittgensteinian there. That meaning equals use. So. If people use a word in a certain meaning, that's it. No Plato for me. Right, right. There's no essentialness, essential yeah. nature. Um, but what, what does that mean for our politics? If, uh, if, we, have, if we have deep fakes, if right. nothing is real. And so I just enjoy being pushed on what reality is by somebody showing me a video. Uh, actually, give me some examples of what's happening in China where they have these videos where you can put your head on some... I think they don't do politicians, they don't do porn. But <laughs> I think <they're laughs> Right, no, they have, they have apps. They have... Um, right, they have apps where you can, you can... you can meld your face with a celebrities in a film, right? Um, which is... it's very limited now. Like, it's sort of only certain film scenes that you can, you can do that, right? I think you can... I think you can become Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic or something like that. Um, but uh, but it's, no, it's growing, right? And it definitely will become a thing. Um, and you know, in China, it's really interesting because they're, in China they're confronting this and that almost all of the apps, all of the phones have the ability to, um, built in when you take selfies to like beautify. Oh, totally, it, right? uh, of course, I mean, you know. 
So then, so basically nobody in China assumes that anything is real, that any photo of any beautiful woman they see on the internet is real. Um, and so you think the Chinese people are very cynical and they're very savvy, right? And, and they know nothing is real. But then recently there was a case of a, of a very popular live, live video streaming uh, hostess who, who, was, who, because of a glitch in her software, suddenly appeared as her actual self. And it turns out, you know, everyone thought she was a young, you know, teenage, willowy, beautiful girl with huge eyes. And she actually turned out to be a sort of somewhat overweight, middle-aged woman. Uh, and people were really upset, which is interesting, right? Because, of course, they know that all, all of this is fake. But when, they, when they're confronted with the reality of it not being fake, they get upset. That is interesting. Wow. So, so it, does, it feels like maybe there is, maybe there is a, a range of fakeness that people are willing to accept. But, but once you get out of a certain, once you get out of that range, then, then it becomes problematic. But I don't know. I don't know. I guess we'll see. It's a brave new world. Yeah. Do you understand TikTok? Uh, barely. Um, I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, I understand the appeal. It's like it's a very. Have you been on it? No, I uh, was sitting next to Raven, right. my wonderful former TA and friend, and he showed it to me on a plane, and I thought to myself, "What the duck?" Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I mean, in some ways it's like the internet distilled, right? It's like 15 second or whatever, 12 or 13 or 14 second clips of people doing weird stuff, right? It's like, it's, you know, and then you, and it just scrolls, right? So it's like silly video Twitter. Uh, and it's like, and you can just kind of endlessly waste time and be amused, you know, infinite, infinitely. Um, so in some ways, I think, it, like, if, if you look at the logic of the internet, it makes perfect sense that, that something like TikTok uh, was born and has become popular. So here at this conference, we talked about, they talked mainly about Europe or Germany versus the US or Silicon Valley. Right. And I was actually thinking, I think they're missing something in China. But is geography the most important ordering dimension or is it not rather age? Oh, right. right. Uh, the world is spiky, not flat that people in the vicinity of here are very similar. I mean, Google being like a mile away, being right. very similar to people around Tsinghua, Hubei, Da. Right. And so maybe we need to think about different ordering criteria or different axes than geography, ethnicity, gender, age, Right. Education, social economic status. Right. What actually are the relevant axes? Right, how right, physicists right. would ask. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, it's probably a combination of all of them, right? It's a, it's a, it's a big spiky ball of, of variables. But um, I mean, but I, you know, I, I do think that geography is one of them, right? I mean, I think if you look at China, China is a very different place, and I think that I think that TikTok will be really interesting to see how long. How long it lasts? I mean, part of part of it is like the novelty of like this app from China showing people like weird things from China that they've never seen before. So maybe that will sort of overcome the the geographical barrier that China has imposed on its own internet. Um, but I guess we'll have to see. These things are so unpredictable, right? Then another story we always hear uh, an AI story is that newscaster, this uh, Chinese. Right. Um, I don't know much about that. The CCD, this is, so this is the CCTV newscaster is a fake, or I don't know if it's a CCTV newscaster, but a state uh, television uh, station in China rolled out an AI anchor. Uh, and it was, it was quite good. I mean, the, the, the joke is because the anchors in China are so robotic already that there basically was almost no difference. Um, but it's... Uh, but it makes, you know, it makes you wonder, though, whether that would work outside of China. This might be one of those geographical things. Maybe it works in North Korea and China. Uh, but with that, can you have AI anchors outside of countries where they have robotic journalists already? Or, I think, being Andreas here, I would say, who wants a human journalist if they can have a robot? You can speed it up, they can stuff us up. Or you can have, you know, I would like to see a girl here tonight with long hair and small eyes. 
Click, click, click. And right. there is your news read by. Right. I think a lot of people would argue that um, people, people enjoy human connection, even if it's the illusion of human connection. Illusion. Right. Um, but if, and that might be, you know, we were talking about the, the video of the, the, the woman who was like, who's, whose true identity was suddenly revealed. It's uh, a great one, yeah. Um, I think people, maybe what people were reacting to was that their illusion was shattered. They, had, they were able to convince themselves that this was a real person. Uh, and suddenly they weren't. And I think, so maybe the factor is you, you could have an AI anchor, but that AI anchor has to be convincing enough that people can, can convince themselves that they're having a human connection. So you know I always like to push boundaries. So in one class at Berkeley, maybe two years ago, I had people from one of these live streaming sites come. Do you right. know what I'm talking about? Like Cam4, Chatterbait. Right, so, right, sure. Yeah, yeah. I don't know which ones are in China, but... Um, there, there are lots. There are lots. Like dozens. Yeah. Yeah. And it was super interesting um, because we, I didn't know when actually do they really have a model there and when is it just some video which is playing. Right, right. And then uh, people bid, Cam4 was the example, I'm sure it's around. People bid certain amounts and then the person says, okay, I'm going to take my t-shirt off for this right. amount. And then I realized, who knows, that the first five bids are not just mechanical, not by people. Right, and right. then you feel, what? We have already been bidding 90 uh, units Another 10 and the T should get off, I put down the extra 10. Right, the psychology right. of we are almost there. Right, I right. No idea. Yeah. And then I promise to them that if there's anything in the class video which they don't want, they need to let me know and I will take it out. Right. So then came the email from actually Level 2 Productions saying, oh, we need to take this part out. Okay. And I've, of course, I of course only watched the right, two the minutes they want to take out. Right, 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 right. Which was about the geography, where people actually claim they are from versus where they actually are from. Huh. And where, was, where were the people claiming to and be I from? I can't tell you because I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> but right. it is an interesting world about identity and about people wanting to see what they want to see and then the illusions are shattered. It must be, by the way, very interesting. To be one of these models, you think about it, you're always by yourself. Right. Yeah. You have that whole screen of people. I think that's even worse than you know, doing a video here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On that note, should we get dinner? On that note, we'll get dinner. Okay. Thank you for watching and All thank right. you, John. All right. Thank you.